Brothers and sisters, I invite you to take your places in the sanctuary or draw near, if you are Zooming in with us, uh, draw near to uh, whatever device you are using, incline your hearts now to the Lord, and let us use this time of the prelude to prepare to worship our God together. May the peace of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I welcome you to this worship service with First Presbyterian Church. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we begin our worship service this morning, there are uh, a few announcements that I will highlight. Uh, today at 1130, we have a called congregational meeting. It's not our uh, usual annual meeting that will be uh, on January the 30th, but a called meeting for the purpose of, of a, uh, addressing the issue, shall we go to a unicameral structure and the bylaws that we would need to change if we do that. Well, we've talked about that, we've uh, had some discussion sessions, but this is uh, the time when we will put that to a vote. So that will be online only at 1130. It's a separate Zoom link. I think Kim already sent that link out and uh, you'll be able to, uh, to join us for 1130. So uh, today, right after worship, um, those of us who are here will go home to participate in that meeting. Uh, there will not be any coffee fellowship today and, and not uh, through the rest of this month. So we will gather for worship. Uh, we want to be uh, careful, certainly, uh, with, uh, uh, with our exposures. And uh, it just work, it works out well schedule-wise for us not to do coffee. We hope to resume that in February. The annual meeting, our... Uh, regular uh, annual meeting will be online also. That will be on January the 30th. Annual reports are due for that on Tuesday. So if you are responsible for an annual report, if you can please get that to uh, Peggy uh, Schultz, or if you get it to Carol, she'll send it to uh, Peggy um, on Tuesday. That would be, that would be great. Our call to worship is from Psalm 130. 
Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Brothers and sisters, let us worship God. Good morning. Good morning. Please join with me in the affirmation of faith, which is printed in the bulletin. Let every tongue confess. Jesus Christ is Lord. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every name should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You may be seated. You will note in the bulletin we're doing our confession and assurance of sin a little differently this morning. Uh, it's not Psalm 37, it's actually Psalm 32. Thank you, Sherry Cohn. And, uh, but please follow along in the bulletin as uh, we are asking you to 
read responsibly the bold print that's in the bulletin. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man who For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, the Lord had been on my strength was dried up, that's why I gave you I acknowledged my sin to you, and did I, I did not cover my iniquity. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. Thanks be to God. Today's Bible reading is from 1 John. You can find that on your pew Bible on page 1301. And I'll be reading the first 10 verses of chapter 1. In the pew Bible, the, the uh, headlines are the word of life, walking in the light, and leading into chapter two, which is, we're not reading, but is Christ our advocate. Let's read. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. Uh oh. Uh -oh. So that you may, you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Catechism questions are from question 12 of the New City, New City Catechism. And the question reads, what does God require in the ninth and 10 commandments? The answer is ninth, that we do not lie or deceive. 10th, that we are content, not envying anyone. I don't think we have any children in the room this morning. Uh, we'll see if there are any who can uh, zoom in with us. Let's see if there are some to show up on my screen here.
Jesus, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now. taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first be Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 44. If you're following in Pew Bibles, you'll find this on page 47 in Pew Bibles. Genesis 44. 
Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, through many dangers and toils and snares, we have already come. And we are still going through them. And we will in this world, in this life. But your grace has brought us safe thus far. Your grace will lead us home. So we come and we bow before you thankfully for your amazing grace. And Lord, we pray that you would remind us of your grace, remind us of your character, remind us of your call and your claim upon our lives as we spend time together under your word. Lord, what a wondrous thing it is that you love us, that you make us, and that you speak to us in your word. So Lord, help us to receive our, this word this morning for what it is, that it is the very word of God. It is your word. And we pray that you would help us to receive it and to respond to it with faith and with obedience. And Lord, may you send your Holy Spirit now with great power to take this word and accomplish your holy purposes in our hearts and our minds and in the conduct of our lives so that our conduct might re re uh, reflect your grace and that our lives may give glory and honor to you always. For we pray this through Jesus our Savior. Amen. We return this morning to the story of Joseph. And Father Jacob has favored Joseph as his favorite of the 12 sons. His brothers, Joseph's brothers, didn't like that at all and they learned to hate Joseph. And so if you remember that when they had the chance they threw Joseph into a pit and then they sold him into slavery and he was carried into Egypt. And then these brothers go home and they break their father's heart with a lie that Joseph was killed by wild animals. So Joseph ends up in Egypt and he spent 13 years as a slave or in prison. But God raised him up. We have seen uh, through the story how God amazingly, providentially, miraculously raised Joseph up until he became Pharaoh's right-hand man, second in charge of all of Egypt. And God led Joseph to see that a famine was coming and Joseph stored up the grain in the land over seven years of great abundance. And now there has come, they're now in the second year of a terrible famine and there is no food anywhere. And the whole known world is relying upon the storehouses in Egypt. And so the brothers from Canaan have come down as so many people have to Egypt to buy grain in order to survive in the, in the famine. And this is now their second trip down. It's been 22 years. The brothers no doubt think that Joseph is dead. And when they come before him in Egypt, they don't recognize him. He's all grown up, right? He's all dressed in Egyptian finery in a big house as the king's vice regent. And so they come down again because they've run out of the food that they bought the first trip. They've come down and they stand before their Joseph, their, their brother, unknowingly once again. And that's where we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 44. Hear the word of God. Then Joseph commanded the steward of his house, 
fill the men's sacks with food, these are his brothers, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, with his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practiced divination? You have done evil in doing this. When he overtook them, he spoke to them these words. They said to him, Why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouth of our sacks we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? Whichever of your servants is found with it shall die, and we also shall be my Lord's servants. He said, Let it be as you say. He who is found with it shall be my servant, and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack. And he searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and every man loaded his donkey and then returned to the city. When Joseph and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? And Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it for me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Then Judah went up to him and said, O Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and our young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, go again, buy us a little food, we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down, for we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me, and I said, surely he has been torn to pieces, and I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs in evil to Sheol. Now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall, I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, 
I must have been about three years old when I was standing in the checkout line at Smiling Smitty's grocery store. I'd been there lots of times before, and every time I'm standing at the, staring at the candy that is right there on both sides of the checkout aisle, at eye level, at my eye level, at hand level. I don't remember all the times that I was tempted, but I remember the time I gave in. And I reached out and I grabbed a piece of bazooka bubblegum. I didn't know if they still made it. I was walking the mall the other day and I went into a candy store and I found bazooka bubblegum. You remember these, the white wrapper? inside the Bazooka Joe comic book, uh, comic strip. And he had that, still has that weird friend that has the red turtleneck that's always up to his nose. It seems very COVID-y, doesn't it? It's a small, small container, still the same white wrapper, hard pink gum. And I stuck a piece in my pocket. It felt heavy all the way home. And as soon as the car stopped, I jumped out of the, out of the car and ran around the back of our house and unwrapped that piece of gum and popped it in my mouth. I thought I had gotten away with it, the perfect heist. I thought I had been completely cool and covert, nothing suspicious here. And I had no more bitten into that hard piece of gum than my dad comes walking briskly around the corner of the house. He was looking for me, and I was found out. Now, I can't remember what other uh, punishments or reparations might have been involved at that occasion, but I will never forget that my parents made me spit that piece of bubble gum into a baggie, and they tapped, taped the baggie to the door frame of my bedroom so that I would see that piece of gum whenever I came in or went out. I've obviously never forgotten that. My three-year-old mind thought that I had gotten away with it. But my guilt was completely obvious to my parents. And now we're grown up, and we still think we can get away with things. But our guilt will find us out, one way or another. And we may fool other people. We may fool them our whole lives, but we will not fool our Heavenly Father. In our passage today, we see a family that's been torn apart by sin. Ten brothers are guilty of a heinous act. But it's been some time, and they think that no one now will ever know. They stand before Joseph. They don't recognize Joseph yet, but Joseph knows them, doesn't he? And instead of identifying himself, he sets them up. He frames them for a theft. Why does he do that? Joseph is testing his brothers. Are they still ruthless? Are they still selfish? And when Joseph's prized cup is found in their bags, they don't protest very much. They knew they had been guilty of far worse. They sold their brother. They shattered their father with a lie. They lived with that guilt in their heart all of these years. 
And in verse 16, Judah says, on behalf of all the brothers, Judah says, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. And I think he's probably puzzled about this cup. How, how on earth did this happen? But he's also thinking about the guilt that has haunted them all of these years. They are guilty. And they have shown no signs of repentance. Maybe they felt bad. They probably did. But had they changed at all? There are a few things that I see in this chapter. And the first thing that I lift out this morning is that true repentance is hindered when we think that our sins are hidden, even from God. We can't make changes in the direction of God and away from our sin. We, we can't change, we won't change, I should say, if we think we're getting away with things. We won't admit our sin, we won't, admit, we won't uh, seek forgiveness, we won't make any adjustments in what we do or say if we think nobody knows. We try to be sneaky and we may fool other people, but God knows, doesn't he? And we know we're guilty. We know we're guilty of various sins. We can't read through the Ten Commandments without feeling the prick of conscience in our lives. We know we're guilty and that guilt eats away at us. It brings shame, it brings self-loathing, it brings denial and alienation. We need relief, we need forgiveness. And we don't seek it because we're so busy trying to maintain cover and, and keep up the facade, pretending we're good when we're not. We need help. True repentance begins when we acknowledge that, when we acknowledge our guilt, our, our sin, our need for God's forgiveness. There is hope. There is hope for relief. There is hope for change. But the first step is to stop rationalizing things, to stop making excuses or pointing to what other people are doing. We admit our sin. On a previous buying trip, the first time that the brothers came down to buy food when the famine had hit so hard. Joseph tested them that time too. He accused them of being spies. And that's when he insists that they bring their younger brother down next time to show their good faith. And the brothers conclude that God is punishing them for their sins. It's been a while since we were in Genesis 42, since before Christmas, before Advent. But a few chapters ago, we saw in Genesis chapter 42, verse 21, the brothers, they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty. In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, did I not tell you to sin against the boy? Isn't there always one that will just wag the finger? Uh, uh, did I not tell you to sin against the boy? He was one of them, right? Did I not tell you to sin against the boy, but you did not listen? So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. And then in verse 28, at this their hearts failed them, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us. This is not just bad karma. This is God's judgment. And they deserved it. And sinners deserve it. And we deserve it. Remember King David, the great <clears throat> The man in God's own heart, the, the one who, whose kingdom was glorious, and he sat on top of it all. He could have anything he wanted, and he decided what he wanted 
was Bathsheba, another man's wife. So he sinned with Bathsheba, and he covered it up, didn't he? He covered it up by having Bathsheba's husband killed. And he thought he had gotten away with it until a prophet confronts him. And then he begins to take steps in true repentance, and he admits his guilt. And he prays to God in Psalm 51, Against you, you only have I sinned, O God, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Guilt makes us miserable, and confession is the way to find relief. That's the message of Psalm 32. The, we read part of that psalm responsively together. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. That's what guilt does. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Joseph's brothers have kept their sin hidden for so long. Now they are coming to grips with it. It's the beginning of true repentance. But we are not quite done yet. True repentance also leads to a change of heart and behavior. True repentance is not only confession, but change. And I think this is important. I think we gloss over this too often. We want to be free from guilt, but we don't want to change. We don't want to be caught, but we still want to do what we want to do. God wants us to change. Now hear this clearly, God does forgive us. That's what the cross of Christ is all about. He paid for our sins with his own life. We are guilty, and we are pardoned in Christ. We are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. But God also wants us to change, to walk in the, in the light, to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, in the light of Christ, to grow in the likeness of Jesus. So repentance is more than simply saying we're sorry. It's saying, Lord, I want to change. Help me change. But we don't talk about that part very much. Uh, part of the reason for that is theological, I think. We, we do understand the grace of the gospel, that we are forgiven, we are clean, we are, the condemnation is removed from us, not because of our ability to repent perfectly, but rather because of the perfect grace of Christ who gave his life for us. We understand that, and we hold fast to that, and that is precious truth. We dare not lose sight of that. So we forget sometimes that God is calling forgiven sinners to walk in his ways, to grow in holiness. The other reason I think we don't think about it is because we're not sure if we can. Because our, our efforts at holiness are, always fall short. And we set our re resolutions and we declare our intentions and we, we offer our prayers, we say we're sorry, we ask for God's help, but we still keep on sinning. And so we we start wondering if it's even possible. We can't repent perfectly so that we never sin. But we can refuse to simply give up and give in. We can deny our rationalizations and our excuses. We can reject the notion that God made me this way, so it must be good. I must be good just exactly the way I am in this particular moment, and I don't have to change. 
No, we're all fallen, sinful human beings, and we all have ways in which we have, have marred the image of God that He has created us to reflect. He calls us to be like Him. We are saved by grace and through faith. We are forgiven. Our Savior loves us just as we are, mind you. But He loves us too much to just leave us as we are. He wants far more for us. He wants us to become the people that God has made us to be. And He is helping us do just that. Never completed in this life but he is helping us. And our text, our passage today shows us, gives us hope because it shows us that this kind of repentance, while never perfect and complete in this life, that this type of repentance is possible. Consider the brothers, especially Judah. Oh, on that fateful day, Joseph came toward them whistling a tune and feeling good about himself and wearing his coat of many colors that his dad had given to him, his mark, I am the favorite son, and he comes up toward the brothers and they have had enough. And they said, nobody's around. Nobody will see. Let's get rid of him. This is our chance. Let's get rid of him once for all. And they throw him in a pit. And it seems like they are intent. They're just going to walk away from the pit. Leave him there. And it's Judah. Judah who, who comes up. He sees on the horizon. There's a trading caravan coming by. Hey, rather than just getting rid of him, let's make a little profit on the deal. Let's sell him. That way we'll be rid of him. We'll have a little spending money to boot. So they all agree to Joseph's, Judah's plan. And years later, the same brothers, they stand unknowingly before the brother that they have betrayed. And Joseph tests them. Joseph says, my cup was found in Benjamin's sack. His life is mine, but the rest of you can go free. Do you see the test? Now what are they going to do? These brothers, these men cold-bloodedly gave up their own brother once for a few coins. If given a chance, will they do it again to save their own skins? Have they learned anything? Have they changed at all? Are there any signs of true repentance? Judah is the one who steps forward and pleads with Joseph. I pledged my father that I would bring Benjamin home safe. If I don't, the grief will kill him. And then he does something amazing. And he says, please let me stay and Benjamin return. Take my life in exchange for his. And doesn't it give us chills as we think of the son of Judah and his son and his son and his son and his son until finally we come to Jesus of the tribe of Judah who says, I'll give my life in exchange for yours. Judah's repentance has led to a change. 
once he broke his father's heart with a lie about Joseph's violent death. And now he intercedes to protect his father's grief. And instead of selling his brother for coins, he is laying down his own life for his brother. Is that what our response to guilt looks like? Are we still hiding it? Are we still denying it? Have we admitted our sin to the Lord who sees all? Have we repented in such a way that our hearts and our actions have begun to change? Not perfectly, to be sure, but perceptibly, by grace. A slave trader by the name of John Newton was deep in sin and blind to it. And one time he hears the gospel and he believes. And he gives his life to Jesus. And over time, Jesus helps Newton to see his sin and begins to change him, not over all at once, but he comes to admit his need for forgiveness and he begins to change. He becomes a pastor and an abolitionist and the writer of the hymn, Amazing Grace. He would also write these often quoted words that I hope can be yours and mine as well as he says, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we are your little children. And you know the times that we have reached out in the candy aisle. You know the times that we have coveted that which we cannot and ought not have. You know the times when our hearts have betrayed us and when our actions have been sinful. And Lord, we are so like little children thinking that we can hide it. But you are the God, are the searcher of hearts. We are amazed, Lord, that you are also the lover of our souls and that you show us amazing grace and forgiving love. Help us, O oh Lord, because of your grace to know that we are forgiven. But help us to admit our sin and turn to you in repentance. And as you wash us clean, help us also to change and to grow. You know, Lord, you see us. You know where we need that right now. Would you place the finger of your Holy Spirit upon that black spot right now in our hearts and our attitudes towards others and the actions that we have done and the words that we have said? Lord, would you put your finger upon it? And Lord Jesus, as you touched the blind and the sick and the lame, with your holy hand, they became clean. Would you make us clean? And Lord, would you make our words and our actions and our thoughts come in line with you, whom you have called us to be? Help us to grow. Help us to grow to be like Jesus. And thank you, O searcher of hearts and lover of souls, that you are with us. Lord, we come before you and we plead that you would be with our congregation as we prepare to meet. And we're contemplating some changes that, 
that are big for us and we need your wisdom so will you come and guide with wisdom Lord we pray that you would be with those who are recovering or grieving uh, after fires and storms in Colorado and Pennsylvania what devastating loss of life children dying in that fire Lord would you bind those wounds would you give us the grace that we need to live day by day in lives that are often hard? And Lord, not only to endure these days, but to find your joy in the midst of them. Lord, be with all of those who are dealing with COVID. Thank you for those of us who have, have uh, uh, gone through COVID and uh, uh, have been healed and have gone through the isolation thank you for that deliverance uh, thank you for those still dealing with the uncertainties of waiting for test results and not wanting to to pass something on to anyone uh, thank you lord for your help in these days when it's just so unsettling and unnerving lord we pray for you to bring an end to this pandemic but that you would also help us to learn to rely upon you in the midst of it. Lord, we pray for those who are crying out for healing and help. Uh, we ask, Lord, for your strong right arm to be with Judy as she is in rehab now and ask that you would add to her strength day by day because of the working of your power. Yes. And Lord our God, we come before you uh, broken but grateful uh, sinful yet redeemed by the blood of the lamb and we cannot but bow before you in gratitude for your amazing grace lord we praise you and we bless you for your life which you gave for us for your the power of your resurrection for the a hope of life everlasting for your presence with us now in this moment and every moment until you come and for hearing us as we pray together as Jesus taught saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat>
now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.